And for those who joined late, my name is Leanne McAllister. I'm the executive director of the Nevada chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. And at the end of this uh, CME talk, I will share uh, the survey to be completed for your CME credit. Thank you. Great. I put this slide back up again in case people were joining at the start of the CME. It is an interactive lecture, so we will be texting Kimberly John 941 to the phone number 22333. Once you've joined, you will get a welcome text telling you that you are in the polling. If you're having trouble um, or questions about it, you can text Leanne or chat, I should say. Disclosures, I have no relevant financial relationships with the manufacturers of any commercial product and or provider of commercial services discussed in the CME activity. I'm not going to discuss anything unapproved or investigative um, in our presentation either. The objectives are to discuss infection prevention and control transmission precautions, discuss application of transmission precautions, and identify ways to mitigate the risk of infection transmission amongst the healthcare community. So we kind of just lead by example, and I really thought that this was fitting because when you look at this grid, there was a study done by YouGov in at the end of 2020, and you have a variety of countries being asked to rank different professions based on how respected they are. And you will see that scientist and medical doctor bubbled up to the top. And so we are in a position to lead by example, not only to our community, but to our staff, the team that we're working with. Um, we're held in this high regard, and I feel like we have a responsibility to set a good example. Um, as I was looking at this grid, I thought it was interesting, this is just a side note, but that social media influencer made this list, and it's not very well regarded, but I've heard a lot of kids who want to be social media YouTubers and influencers. I thought that was interesting. Okay, what's the first word that comes to mind when you hear COVID? So if these bubble up, I'm just going to share. When we were first discussed discussing the infection control CME, I was convinced COVID would be long over and I was going to sound super outdated discussing this topic, um, but it became apparent that as we see surges in other countries, the pandemic isn't quite over um, and it will have left a little bit of a legacy behind for healthcare. So, you know, interesting. Pandemic, yep, it's still a pandemic, still happening. Okay, so let's start with the source. Anywhere that a pathogen lives is a source. They aren't picky and they will use people in a variety of an environmental locations to call home. They don't really have a real estate bubble. And one thing I really want to point out is that, you know, healthcare workers, I highlighted it because, you know, we don't want to be a way that it's where the pathogen is living. We don't want to be sort of contributing to that. Um, and then just don't forget to consider your environmental services in the patient care areas, you know, countertops, tables, equipment. Um, and then, of course, faucets, sinks, the wet areas, ventilators. And we all know about catheter associated infections, IV lines. And then, of course, if there's construction dust, wet material, water leaks, there's a lot of different things happening in our environment that we don't want to overlook. Infection transmission is the way these pathogens are moved to the susceptible person. Susceptibility and vulnerability to COVID was unknown early in the pandemic, which made it a lot more frightening. Um, and so everyone was really viewed as a susceptible person. And I, I don't, I think some of that mentality may stay in terms of who's susceptible, right? Um, but pathogens depend on the people, the environment, and our medical equipment to move in healthcare settings. And the, the ways they really are moving through healthcare settings are contact, sprays and splashes, inhalation, and sharp finger foods. In terms of contact, contact makes pathogens by touch. We think of MRSA as a good example of the sort of this contact trans transmission. Um, your hands become contaminated, you're touching something, and then it spreads to a susceptible person. 
Um, and dirty hands is really something we're all familiar with from an early age. Sprays and splashes. When we think about sprays and splashes, we can imagine that person who's sneezing or coughing right beside us. And we feel uncomfortable because we know there could be transmission in that moment. Um, and then these tend to enter by eyes, nose, mouth to cause an infection. And we think of pertussis or meningitis, you know, when we think about spray and splash and droplet transmission. So what percentage of a population needs to be vaccinated against COVID to achieve herd immunity? What do you think? So it's interesting, you know, uh, our answers are really, um, I'd say the majority of people are probably looking at at least 80% or thereabouts. The last thing I heard, and I know this is always evolving, was that um, Dr. Fauci was last quoted as saying 70 to 85% of the population needs to be vaccinated. And so I think that the bottom end of his sort of best guesstimate is where our country has sort of put the goal, you know, we'd like to have 70 percent of people get at least one vaccine by July 4th. Um, of course, no one can be 100 percent certain, so the higher the better. And when it comes to pertussis, for example, we know that falling vaccine rates resulted in outbreaks. Several years ago, California was having an increase, and Nevada, we seem to be a little bit more protected because we had already instituted that Tdap mandate for the 11 year old, the seventh grade, you know, around 11 years old. And so it did confer some protection to our community just by having um, a little bit more herd immunity. Inhalation occurs when pathogens are aerosolized in tiny particles that survive on air currents over great distances. And I think that's sort of the scarier part, right? Over great distances. And when we think about this, we think about TB or measles. And, you know, we, we've all kind of had that nightmare scenario where we have one person in a waiting room and they have measles, you know, we were worried they have measles and then everyone who's ever stepped in that waiting room at, you know, around the same time is possibly infected. <clears throat> so the question is, have you ever seen a case of measles in the past 10 years? And I just want to give it a second in case somebody had, but, you know, I think we've been really lucky um, and it's a double edged sword, right? So we haven't really, most of us have not seen a case of measles in the past 10 years, which means our patients haven't seen a case of measles in the past 10 years. And we worry about the vaccinations um, around it because they don't understand how serious it can be. So just talking about measles and sort of the spreading of it, um, I can see it too. And what's interesting is we know that vaccine rates have sort of been going down. We were seeing more and more cases reported. And you can see in 2019, there was a, a pretty good increase at, you know, over a thousand cases. And in 2020, it drops to 13. And not because vaccination rates are improved, right? Because we know that in 2020, children were not getting their vaccines like they should be because they were sheltering at home and there was a fear of sort of going out. We didn't know if it was something that to travel great distance, COVID could travel great distances and be spread. And so it dropped to 13, which in one way speaks very well to transmission precaution and how um, using masks and hand washing and avoiding contact and all these things really dropped even the transmissibility of measles. But what I think we need to be aware of is that there's a decrease in vaccinations particularly through the vaccine preventable illnesses. And when 2022 comes around and probably a lot of the pandemic stuff has been lifted, we may see this graph look very, very different. And so I think there's a little pressure on us to close that vaccine gap um, and also continue supporting the right transmission precautions in the community. 
what percentage of the population needs to be vaccinated in order to achieve herd immunity from measles? So what's interesting is when I was kind of researching this, it really looked because measles was so much more contagious and traveled further distances than the, the pathogens that were droplet transmitted, it seemed like you might need to have a higher rate of vaccination to achieve herd immunity. Um, and, you know, that's, that's interesting because, of course, there's no perfect number. And we know that when there are outbreaks, the majority of the people who get infected are those that are not vaccinated, but there is some, um, some cases that can be reported even if you have some vaccines. Sharp injuries. So th this is the other way that um, transmission can occur in the healthcare setting. And I think all of us remember the era when you know you get a needle stick and there was an entire protocol, especially on HIV, um, and you'd go down to the ER for prophylaxis if something had happened until you were sure that you had not been um, exposed. I always wash my hands before seeing patients. Yes, no, because I use hand sanitizer, or no, because I might forget sometimes. Okay, so we have a lot of hand sanitizer use in our group. But we have hand washing and nobody forgets, not a single one of us. We are amazing. So there was a 2017 hand washing study and they looked at hand hygiene before direct contact with the patient. And I thought it was really interesting that we were not as good as we re recalled that we were. So you only have 38% of physicians who had observable hand hygiene before direct contact with the patient. And that, and that also uh, kind of translated to the nurses and the nurses' aid. So they also had low uh, hand hygiene before direct contact with the patient. And now this was pre-pandemic, right? So this was in 2017 before the heightened awareness of transmitting the infection. And so I think what's great, well, if anything can be great about a pandemic is we're so much more aware about transmission but hopefully that can stay um, going forward. And if they were to repeat this study in 2022 or 2023, hopefully these numbers would be higher. But I think it also speaks to the fact that as physicians, we are leaders um, and the healthcare provider can really set the tone for that. So doing that example, being that example can elevate the hand washing rates within your own environment. Standard precautions are, you know, intended to be used for all patient care. It's about common sense and using PPE when appropriate. Think about what you're about to do and what to do that you need to protect yourself um, in that situation. And of course, we can see here at the top of the list is performing hand hygiene, using PPE whenever there is an expectation of possible exposure, thinking about hygiene cost etiquette, um, Thinking about patient placement, uh, patient care equipment, environment, cleaning, textile and laundry, you know, uh, that, that's important too, gowns and whatnot. Um, safe injection practices, of, of course, to avoid the sharp injuries, surgical masks for appropriate procedures and, and currently the standards right now, and then ensuring healthcare worker safety, uh, including proper handling of other sharps and needles. Transmission-based precautions are those used in addition to standard precautions for patients with known or suspected infections. And suspected infections are interesting because after the pandemic, there's a heightened awareness of asymptomatic periods and infections. And because we now you know, have a better understanding of asymptomatic infections and periods or an awareness, possibly understanding should not be the right word, but an awareness, this may translate to longer term use of transmission based precautions. And I, I believe the CDC is expecting that as well. And 
in the presentation, which will come to you, you can actually see, you can link to the um, interim uh, guidance by the CDC as well. Um, and how does the guidance compare with traditional? Um, in addition to standard practices recommended as part of routine healthcare delivery, use the additional infection prevention and control practices during the COVID-19 pandemic, which we all agree that it's not quite over yet. And you apply them to all patients, not just the ones that you suspect um, or know have COVID, but just apply them across the board and ensuring that facilities have policies and procedures to ensure the recommendations are appropriately applied in their setting. And again, the link will be sent out later. Infection control methods. These are really tools to protect people from infectious diseases, including COVID, but just across the board. And preventing exposures is really important when vaccines are being developed. But in, in our case now, the vaccines developed, but the other preventable diseases are under vaccinated at this time. And so infection control methods may need to be employed longer until we can also catch up all those vaccines that the children have not been getting. And I believe I heard, you know, there might be something as much as 60% under vaccinated in those uh, routine childhood immunizations in some areas. So it's significant. When you're thinking about infection control methods, these components are meant to be built upon each other. So source control, visitor exclusion, screening and triage, environmental and hand hygiene, and personal protective equipment. Source control should be practiced by everyone in the healthcare facility. You're wearing a mask to cover your nose and your mouth. <clears throat> and it also helps mitigate you touching your own nose and mouth and becoming susceptible. And then having cloth masks available for the patients and visitors. And we, we all know about N95. Triage and screening and instructing patients before seeking care. I think this was a, a, a shift for some practices, you know, kind of reaching out to the patient before the um, visit itself and then talked about telehealth options, what to expect when you arrive, you know, you're gonna have to wear a mask and hand sanitize, et cetera, and then making sure that the offices have supplies for respiratory hygiene and cost etiquette um, and signage about it, looking at how the flow of patients was in and out of the facility, thinking about crowding and how to keep the social distancing for the patients for their safety and their comfort. So there was, there is and was a lot of anxiety around it. And then of course, screening patients. Um, I think people are very used to answering their screening at this point. And so I'm curious if people started employing a form of telehealth in their practice um, after kind of thinking about triaging and screening, if anyone did that. And so that's really great that. Um, you know, a, a good chunk of people were able to really um, pivot to some telehealth to minimize the transmission during the pandemic. Personal protective equipment. It, how well PPE works depends on you. No matter how busy you are, you should take the time to use the right equipment the right way at the right time. And oftentimes providers put themselves last. And I think the pandemic helped highlight that our community can't survive if key sectors like yourselves, like frontline providers, um, are not there to support it. And so, you know, there's so much talk about self-care, but consider this one of those things. If you're in a situation where you need to take care of yourself, please use the PPE you need. So one of our questions is, it was easy for me to get PPE for myself, clinic, and staff. And so just curious if anyone had trouble um, during the pandemic. And so it looks like a majority of people were able to get PPE, but we still had about a third 
that had some trouble getting PPE, which is important for our community to know. So thank you for that. Environmental hygiene. I think the important thing about this is that routine practices for hand hygiene and cleaning the environment and disinfection are effective. They work. Um, you know, it's great that it was obviously formally studied about environmental hygiene with regards to COVID, but the, the, the same stuff is still effective in reducing the transmission. What types of transmission-based precautions have you implemented since the pandemic? It looks like masks and telemedicine were used and limiting, of course, um, folks. Great. So let me ask you this. Do you know a lot about the air quality where you work and what you are doing to optimize it? So it looks like a lot of us could probably look into this a little bit more. And what's interesting is as someone who reviews medical records and charts, I have started seeing some EMR dictation um, for some groups that have been amended with verbiage discussing their HEP filters and their evening electrostatic sprayer protocols. And I thought that was really interesting as I was looking at, you know, the project first line content for this talk. And then realizing that some people were really keyed into their air quality, I thought, wow, I, it wasn't top of mind for me, but clearly um, it is an important thing to consider, you know, in the clinic space. And so I think we have an opportunity to sort of ask those questions where we work and, and figure out if it's optimized. Which is, of course, optimizing indoor air quality, um, talking about the handling systems and uh, Portable solutions, HEPA filter units, and the there's more resource for you, of course, on the CDC website. So you're not alone in figuring this out. And then, of course, the importance of communicating transmission-based precautions, right? You want to make sure you've got signage and everyone's consistent on message, because really what we know is that if people understand it, they are more likely to have buy-in. So nobody wants to just be told something without explanation, but you know, giving them the reasoning is helpful for our teams and our staff and our patients. And then also thinking about some of the other pieces around it, like, you know, are is the PPE and all the equipment conveniently located? Um, can they find the gowns? Um, are they somewhere where they're easy to use? Um, are the signs obviously placed so people can see them? I mean, I really love that the CDC has all these beautiful graphics. So even literacy level um, is taken into consideration when you have signage that's so um, visually apparent. And then thinking about some places to put it, front break rooms, lunch rooms, building entrance, exit, and of course, common spaces for the healthcare staff and also for patients. Um, so this slide is really around COVID, but I left it in the presentation because I thought it brought a discussion about working when we are sick. And I know that for myself in years past, I would have still gone to work with a cold or a sore throat, and I rarely took a sick days. And, um, and, and you guys can judge me for that. That's okay. But, you know, I, I think I was sort of um, indoctrinated into the old school, like doctors just they go, they do it, they don't stop. You know, you have to be in the hospital yourself before you take a sick day. And I would often just don a mask and keep going. And after COVID, I think people view sick days differently. I, I think even our sports calling off sick, we view differently. We now have a new possibly mentality or way of looking at it. Like, you know what, you could be a transmitter. So stay at home, you know, get yourself well, it's okay. 
And so I, I think that has changed our philosophy a little bit. And after COVID, when it's gone, we may still want to think about return to work criteria and how that looks like, you know, for yourself and your staff. And again, to reiterate, we have vaccine preventable illnesses that are ready to have their 15 minutes of fame as COVID sort of exit stage left now. Have you self-quarantined during the pandemic? And it's anonymous, by the way. I don't know who says what, so um, you don't have to worry that anyone's coming after you or any, any of these questions. I should have said that at the beginning, sorry. Okay, about two thirds of us um, had a self quarantine period or more. Well, it's, it's, I'm sorry that you had to self quarantine for those of us who did, um, but I'm glad you took it seriously and, and took those steps. And, you know, as we think about all these transmission based precautions and source, you know, how to stop infection source wise, you know, what of these new precautions or clinic practices are not new, but the ones that we've enforced pretty rigorously for the past year, what do you think is here to stay post pandemic? Yeah, masks and telemedicine. I, I feel that um, patients have found some value in telemedicine too. For many people who have had, you know, the ability to work from home. Um, and for example, today Zoom, we didn't have any commuting to participate in a CME. So I think patients also don't have the hassle of loading, you know, three kids in a car and finding a parking spot and I'm doing the stroller. And so I think telemedicine might have proved itself um, very convenient for some families and masking as well, for sure. I agree with some people are saying. So in closing, um, I think what's important is in addition to standard practices recommended as part of routine healthcare delivery to all patients, additional infection prevention and control practices that have been implemented due to the pandemic can further help us prevent other respiratory borne diseases for our patients. You are a leader, people respect you and will follow your guidance. Our community's health is in your clean hands. Thank you, everyone. Of course, there's resources and the deck is gonna come out to everyone. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. And I really, I love seeing everyone's um, input and answers. We are a small group. There's only 14 of us. So if you want to turn on your camera and ask a verbal question, please do. If you're shy and want to put it in the chat, I will read it for you. Um, I did put in the chat a link to one of the CDC's Project First Line Facebook videos on what, uh, why does ventilation matter? Because Dr. E was talking about that. These videos, um, you know, I've heard from a lot of physicians are like, oh, they're too simplistic. I'm like, they're not for you, they're for your staff. But this is a great way for you to use these videos to um, make sure that your entire staff from the front desk all the way up to the physician are on the same page and getting the same infection control information. Go ahead, Terrence. And I had a question about, um, one of your poll questions asked if you don't wash your hands because you use hand sanitizer. Is there a preference or a difference? Is hand sanitizer appropriate to use or is soap and water better? So I, I think what I found when I was looking at this was, and if someone else has done any more current research, please jump in. We're, we're colleagues here, so I invite anyone to help me on this. I, I found that hand sanitizer was uh, acceptable in between, but then there was an expectation to periodically go back and still do proper soap and water um, for you know the 20 seconds, uh, sing a song, whatever, um, to make sure that you're not just brushing through it. But it, it was considered okay as part of a hand hygiene in that study when they were looking, it was hand washing or hand sanitizer before direct patient care. Both of those combined, physicians were only at 38%. 
I'll chime in. This is Anita Pomerantz. So we know that alcohol-based hand sanitizers work well. They kill germs in our hands, but washing with soaps and water, soap and water removes more than just the bacteria. If we encounter chemicals or pesticides or any heavy metals, those won't be eradicated with just sanitizer. That's a great point, Dr. Pomerantz. Thank you. I had, I had another question. Um, it's actually kind of a two-part question about masks. So um, first of all, do you have any information or do you know if it's practical or worthwhile to double mask? So I've been doing that for a while because I know the surgical masks are more recommended, but the um, cloth mask sometimes can have a tighter fit. And so using the two together may have some advantage. And also just if you have any input on how to deal with now that masking is not required for people in indoor settings if they've been vaccinated? What impact does that have on healthcare settings? So I think that the, the mask, for, to answer your first question, the double mask thing, I personally don't have the numbers around that. So I would have to look that up and get back to you. Um, but intuitively, of course, if you don't have a, a good seal or a high quality mask, and you're concerned about the penetration of droplets and and, and that's, you know, around COVID, it's the, the droplets, right? So if there's a chance of transmitting, then uh, two screens to block droplets would make sense. Um, and your second question was around taking masks off if you've been vaccinated now in the indoor setting. So what we talked about during the talk was that even with measles, we knew that a percentage of people would still get infected, even if they had the vaccine. So I think I understand in the restaurant setting, you know, uh, the mask coming off. In the healthcare setting, it's a place you're inviting sick people to come in concentration. So you may want to consider that difference, may. Uh, and I think that's where, you know, physician voice and physician opinion and, and more research um, might come out as far as if you want to immediately adopt that taking off the mask because we're vaccinated or not because I could still get infected a small percentage just like measles I've had my measles vaccine but I still potentially could get infected and now I'm dealing with a susceptible vulnerable population and do I want to be the person who's transmitting it even if I don't fall very sick so I think there's a lot of nuance there in how you know we're going to approach that as physicians um, because again our view of susceptibility vulnerability and transmissibility are so different a year a year late now compared to a year and a half earlier. It's great. I, you know, the long explanations, it's, I get often asked and I'm like, you know, there's so many shades of gray. I know everybody wants a quick, okay, do this check done. Like, okay, well, no, here's the full explanation. Oh, and by the way, you might have data that changes this in a week. So hold on because, <laughs> Yes, the, the evolution is, is not over, <laughs> for sure. I, I was very, um, I, I, I shared it during the talk, but I was like, oh, it's going to be gone. Are you sure we want to talk about this? And I was so wrong. I mean, of course, that was like back in January, I was really hoping, but. No, certainly not only domestic travel, but international travel is going to impact the spread and the uh, variants of COVID um, for a long time. To, to come. Um, I had a question because one of the questions you asked everyone on the call was what kind of uh, herd uh, immunization rate do we need for measles? And I didn't hear the actual answer. Is it, it, did, it does it have to be higher for something so contagious? It does, it does. So when I was um, kind of researching it for the talk, it looked like it should really be like 95 high. It should be high to, to really push it. I had one more question, if I may. It's actually for the um, about Make a Wish. Um, I know during the introduction about Make a Wish, we said that if you referral it for somebody before they're 18, then it can still get processed, even if it's over they're over 18 when the wish gets fulfilled. Is there a, a lower age limit for kids to get a wish filled? I believe it's two and a half, and maybe Devin will jump in or one of the other Make a Wish team if I have the younger cutoff wrong. 
No, you are correct. Two and a half is, is the age criteria. They must be referred after they turn two and a half and uh, before their 18th birthday. And then um, to get extra nuanced here, uh, we have until the child turns 21 to actually fulfill that wish. Great question. And um, kind of a follow-up question about the referral process. If we have a kid who we think might be eligible, but we don't want to bring it up to the family in case they're not, can we consult with you about the about a case to determine whether or not they're even eligible for that referral? Absolutely, and I encourage you to do so. Um, that way, we don't get a family's hopes up if if. Uh, appropriate, you know. Um, we also have access to our national medical affairs team who creates, works with our national medical advisory committee. So of course, all of our chapters have our own uh, medical advisory committees. And then our national office has the one that uh, consults with each other to create medical criteria for different subspecialties. Um, and they also consider certain cases if they're a little bit more complex and require some extra discussion uh, to decipher whether a child truly qualifies or not. So we can go ahead and ping our national medical affairs team to say, hey, we have a physician who's inquiring about this specific case. We can uh, ensure that the child remains anonymous to respect HIPAA, of course, um, but just give you a little bit of clarity about what the um, what the child's case would ultimately be, whether they would qualify or not. So I put a link um, to the CME accreditation and designation statement, and I'm going to put a link to the survey in just a moment. Um, but but please don't be shy, even if you have a question or just a comment. Um, the if you haven't looked at the the Facebook videos from the CDC's Project First Line, that one link will take you to the one specifically about why does ventilation matter, but there's a whole series of them and um, they really were designed, you know, the, the folks, the guy who came to talk to the American Academy of Pediatrics said, we kind of envision like hospital workers waiting for the employee bus to take them to their car. And if they're just standing there in the waiting for the transportation that they can watch these really quick videos and check off their training for infection control at the same time. So keep that in mind when you're watching the videos that that was the motivation for when they were, that they're short enough, they're simple enough, and they're directly to the point to kind of do this training in, a, in an easy format while somebody's just on their, their phone with a set of headphones waiting for the bus to take them to their car at the end of their shift. And the other thing I wanted to share in the file, I shared the Make-A-Wish brochure, um, but also if you are a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics um, and you're having trouble getting PPE, uh, one of the benefits of membership is to have an Amazon business account, which um, if there ever is a shortage again, I think right now there, there aren't problems, but if there is, then you're identified as someone who qualifies to get scarce resources at a time when other people might be panic buying. Um, so that can be a good resource to uh, take advantage of. I'm just gonna go and get the link. All right. So if everyone would uh, complete our post event uh, survey for today, it's required if you're claiming CME, it's optional if you're not, we just appreciate the feedback for today's event. Um, our chapter is going to continue to working with the American Academy of Pediatrics and the CDC's Project First Line um, to encourage um, all healthcare workers in Nevada to keep up on, because I think because you do it all day, every day, Right? I think that's why the perception of, of course I wash my hands and the reality of, did you really wash your hands? Um, it's so easy to do because you have to do it so often in a day. So thank you all so much for being here. I'm gonna stay on to the last person leaves. So if you have any questions or comments, I'm gonna um, end the recording and I will be sending it out uh, along with the slides to all the participants. <laughs>